Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 816. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 8th, 2023. All right, welcome to our happy place. This is Anglican Unscripted, where Kevin and George sit down in front of their webcams and talk about the news around the world. Hopefully Anglican news, usually Christian news, sometimes a little bit of politics when it becomes that season. And that season's coming up, George, unfortunately. Before we get too far into the show, please like and subscribe. Uh, The show really does continue after we uh, click the stop button and upload it. It continues in the comments. Please go there to add your opinion, give us ideas for future shows, And in the unlikely event we're wrong on something, you can put it in the comments. That's a great place to go. George, how are you doing this week? Just fine. Uh, Very busy. Uh, Summer is the slow season in Florida, but for for us locals, we have to get ready for the fall, all the people coming back and getting ready for Sunday school starting and all the programs and projects, ministry meetings, and uh, just a busy time. A lot of busy work. (laughs) We happen to be still stuck in South Dakota with our rig. We're looking for a part. So if you guys could pray that we could find the part for our uh, Sasquatch, that would be great. We've been stuck here for about a month, and we have people all over the country looking for us, but there does not seem to be a steering knuckle available for this year's model of RV. And uh, uh, <laughs> we're looking to have one made if we can't find one, but we're still looking. So uh, please keep us in your prayers as we want to continue our travels. George, let's move on to the news. There's a lot happening out there. And, you know, part of our job as journalists is to observe and use kind of the acumen we know. We know, based on the history, what is uh, popular to talk about, what's really uh, in the news and not in the news. And when something is over, like when the game is over. And we posted some comments from the Archbishop of uh, Nigeria, uh, kind of a state of the state thing. And what was not in his letter is the most notable. Because in the past, the topics of the day uh, and the people he wished to interact with as Archbishop would be foremost in his letter. And this letter included not mentioning the Archbishop of Canterbury, not mentioning anything about international Anglicanism except for GAFCON. And this is a big change. A big change, George. It's over. How should I put that? Yeah, it is. Uh, This is the the fat lady singing. It's over. The Archbishop of Nigeria, Henry Ndekuba, Archbishop of all Nigeria, Mm -hmm. gave an address to the chancellors and lawyers and legal leaders of the Church of Nigeria, where he gave a State of the Church speech, several thousand words long. And we printed the transcript on Anglican Inc. And as as exactly as you say, Ken, Kevin, it's notable for what he didn't say. 90% is about the uh, uh, local issues, uh, government and church administration and the uncertainty and the, and the economy and this and that and the other. And then there are two small paragraphs about the GAFCON movement and the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans. Church of Nigeria is a proud member of both, but more verbiage in this speech is giving to the church's bookshop its financial difficulties than it is to international Anglicanism. Now, is it because that's no longer an oppressing issue? No, I believe it's because the Canterbury communion is this is evidence that it is dead in the eyes of the Church of Nigeria, where it doesn't really merit the discussion or time because everybody's on the same page. We're over that. We're past that. They're going to do what they're going to do. We're going to do what we're going to do. We claim the mantle and heritage of the Anglican way and ethos. And they can they can go their own way. Well, it's that or it's just too embarrassing to talk about it. I don't want to talk about our relations with the international Anglicans because of the the strut they brought us after the last Lambeth, or the strut they're bringing us now in the Church of England over the news that they want to introduce this LLF uh, syndrome. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I, there, I think there's many reasons for it, because it, 
in a in a real living world where all things are perfect, we would want to have a relationship with the Archbishop of Canterbury, with the See of Canterbury, with the Church of England, and to see an African nation uh, such as Nigeria not even talk about it in its state of the state uh, address is amazing. But there was one other overseas thing I would say, but it was indirect, and mm -hmm. it speaks to the difficulties the ACNA is having with the Church of Nigeria. The Church of Nigeria is going full speed ahead with its setting up uh, chaplaincies for the Nigerian diaspora around the world. You know, Nigerians living in Europe, in America, Canada, Australia, and the Persian Gulf area. Um, no more is there a sense that uh, we're going to start an Orthodox province here, an Orthodox province there, and then the Nigerians who moved to the U.S. can join this group. Rather, we're going back to the good old days of uh, Nigerian church for Nigerians in America, in Canada, in England. So uh, there's no, uh, that, that was a difficulty, a sticking point between the ACNA and the Church of Nigeria, where they uh, consecrated some bishops without sort of letting the, the ACNA know. But that's just the way it's going to be, the Church of Nigeria is telling the world. It is, because I think that the age of the, the promises that Peter Akinola made are over. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, he was a great archbishop back then, but he didn't know the importance of us making Nigerians around the world, not just Orthodox Anglicans. And mm -hmm. I think, that, you know, this would be called, you know, Nigeria's colonization. They're here to colonize mm -hmm. as best they can uh, where there are existing Nigerians. We had some correspondence from one viewer saying, would we talk about the uh, prospects of Anglican uh, Orthodox reunion, maybe by uh, uh, 2054 on the thousandth anniversary of the split between Rome and Constantinople, at least the Anglicans will join up with Constantinople, Constantinople again. And I don't think it's likely, uh, given the way things are right now. And one of our viewers pushed and that said, well, you know, here's what the Orthodox say. What do we say? I say, well, you know, they have their views. But, you know, the Orthodox have a problem of, uh, you know, in the United States, there's Greek Orthodox, Russian, Romanian, this, that, and the other, of nationalism and yeah. na national identity being tied into Orthodoxy. And they're not able to get over that. And we may be coming more like the Orthodox, sadly, in that aspect where you're Nigerian Anglican or American Anglican or this sort of Anglican or that sort of Anglican, where your national identity is as important as your uh, religious identity in the descriptor, which would I think, which is not, which is contrary to the spirit of Anglicanism, but well, we're it's... seeing that being developed. We're, we're on the facts on the ground are that that's happening more and more in the United States with uh, the church in Nigeria. And they're doing it other places as well. Absolutely. Well, we find that in uh, um, evangelical Protestantism. Pro, I can't even talk today uh, here in America as well. That, that there is that patriotic uh, contribution, uh, as you mentioned, much so, much, much more so in Orthodox. All right, George. Let's hit the second story. Um, there was someone elected Bishop of Ontario named William Cliff. But George, as you and I are journalists, we observe the written news, press releases that come out, and what's not said. And what happened after this bishop was um, elected, we heard there's an investigation. Some complaints were followed. Then we got some emails from uh, parishioners in the Diocese of Ontario saying, what's going on? And then we hear, oh, all clear. This is a good guy. He's clear. But the way it was announced to us was with, we investigated him. We can't prove the charges. So he's all clear. That's what we heard. Well, maybe there's a cultural thing going on here. And we're reading the same English language statement, but we're interpreting it as Americans. And maybe Canadians speak differently than we do. Canadians um, are different than us, George. It's almost the difference between the English and the Americans. So... William Cliff, I believe, is Bishop of Brandon, uh, which is in the Prairie, uh, the 
in western central western Canada, and he was elected Bishop of Ontario, or and he was to be translated, as the official term is, mm -hmm. from one diocese to another, and a complaint was filed, and everything was put on hold while it was investigated, and no details of the complaint were released. And then out of the blue, the Archbishop of, of the province of Ontario, I think Anne Germond, uh, said, with, I would say with bad grace, uh, well, the, the investigators concluded and the charges were not proven, which is sort of a really backhanded way. Uh, in other words, they didn't say, they didn't say he was innocent. They said it wasn't proven. And the, uh, the, does she dislike him? Was it just the bureaucratic mindset? Well, we're not going to tell you because she makes it quite clearly in her letter that we're not going to say what this complaint was about. And so we're getting calls, emails from people in Ontario saying, well, what was the charge against the bishop? We'd like to know. So would we. Well, and, you know, the thing is, it is nothing out there. Nobody's talking about it. And I just can't uh, get a handle other than uh, Andrew Mon doesn't seem to like this guy and is basically damning him with faint praise. It's, it's it, you know, we run across strange stories all the time. This would be one of them. If you do know some information uh, that we should know, uh, you can forward it to us. You'll find the email in the comments on our YouTube channel. Let's go here. And the, the, here's the, in my opinion, this is the big story of the week. Um, and The Dean of Buffalo arrested for exposing himself to a little girl in a swimming pool. No, that's not the biggest story of the week. Oh, okay. Does, okay. I, that doesn't even make the top 10, because that's an Episcopal story. That's a Church of England story. No, we have a story here with the Episcopal Church about a liturgy I did not know existed. And you probably did, because you are a historian of the Church. Did you know that there was a name-changing liturgy in the Episcopal Church, George? Well, I use them for dogs and cats. <laughs> you know. cats. <laughs> now, Fluffy, I'm sorry, you found out Fluffy is actually a Fred. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Name this cat. Well, actually, it turned out in 2015, the Episcopal Church, deciding to be cutting edge, said on the Book of Occasional Services, we should have a, cert a liturgy for a renaming ceremony for a person mm -hmm. who's had a sex change. It's not a baptism. It's just a renaming. And I frankly hadn't heard it ever having taken place. Well, a parish in Fargo, North Dakota. Of yes, course. Yes, folks, there is Fargo. a gay-friendly <laughs> parish in Fargo. It's near the University of North Dakota and I actually happened to know the, the rector there, uh, Jamie, Father Jamie. And it's the gay-friendly parish in all of North Dakota. So if you're gay and in North Dakota, that's your choice mm -hmm. uh, for going to church. Any denomination, that's your choice. So they had a little niche. And a fellow, a, a person named Andrea Olson was renamed. Andrea Olson from North Dakota might have been Ole Olson. I Ole don't know. Ole yeah, who knows? Yeah. And there's a, there's a glowing, fawning Episcopal Church uh, press release about this beautiful service where this fellow is standing in the footsteps of uh, Jacob, who was renamed Israel, and Abram, who was named renamed Abraham, and Saul, who was renamed Paul. And now this fellow has been renamed Andrea because he's now a girl. And Kevin, you and I were talking, and there's something missing in this guy's logic. Um, well, yeah. Is... <laughs> well, now, if you look at Scripture as a whole, as partial, by book or chapter or verse... Any renaming is done in the same gender. Okay? Saul became Paul. Saul did not become Paula. Okay? The, the renaming is the same gender. And so for the Episcopal Church, and especially this church in Fargo, North Dakota, to go out of its way to have a renaming ceremony for somebody who surgically, surgically altered themselves and legally changed their name from uh, one gender to another is odd when we understand christian principles it's odd when we understand 
the, te- the the New Testament, the Old Testament. It's understand. It's odd when we understand why Saul changed his name. It was to escape sin, not to grasp it. You're absolutely right, Kevin. And it's doubly difficult because the epis- the fellow in this ENS news article press release made a big deal about the fact that we're not just some local community church, but this is part of the Episcopal Church, the Worldwide Anglican Communion, yeah. and that really means I, as a transgender man or woman, I forget what you, you know, he's a man who became a woman, so I guess you'd see a mm-hmm. transgender woman. I'm affirmed in this because praying shapes believing. We right. believe this because we now have a prayer for it. As an, as an Episcopalian, my name and my gender change is now and must be accepted by the Church of Nigeria, the Church of Uganda, the Church of of England. They wouldn't have a problem with it. <laughs> uh, you know, it must be accepted not just in Fargo, not just in this local community church. Um, but because I'm an Episcopalian, this must be affirmed and accepted around the world. The sadness is that, you know, this fellow needs psychiatric help. I'm doing long-distance diagnosing, of yeah, course, yeah, but there yeah. is a... There is a medical diagnosis for this man's illness, gender dysphoria. Yeah, DSM-5, you can find it in there. And rather than be be pastoral and help this fellow come to grips with whatever crisis is going through his life Mm -hmm. that has triggered this psychotic episode, instead the church is going out of its way to bless castration, bless, you know, taking estrogen therapy, bless doing all this and that, resulting in someone who really does not pass for a woman, even if long hair um, and a dress. Uh, or chromosomes, or uh, you can't pass for a woman because you're mimicking a woman. If all womanhood is, is the essence of being able to be mimicked, well, then womanhood is nothing. Yeah, it means nothing to be a woman. I find it interesting the second to last paragraph uh, in the press release from the Episcopal Church. The renaming service came at a time when anti-trans sentiment and legislation is increasing nationwide. The North Dakota legislature, for example, recently adopted 10 laws that targeted transgendered children especially, including a ban on new gender-affirming care for minors and some transgendered athletes. Now, yeah. th- this speaks to a, a reality that's going on, is there is finally a response to this wokeism in in flyover country, North Dakota, uh, every place that's not on the coast. People are waking up to say, no, we don't need to mutilate our children. We don't need to cut off and uh, give little 12-year-old girls mas- mastectomies because uh, we th- th- this little girl one day decides she's a boy. We need to... T- step back and take a longer approach. And when a longer approach is taken, 98% of those who have transgender feelings return to the same sex biological uh, feelings by the time they enter their 18, exit their 18 or 19th uh, birthday, George. You're, yeah. Kevin, the, the science, and I don't want to sound like Al Gore here. No, no, the science. science. <laughs> the consensus of uh, scientific thought is that this is you know, the Episcopal Church acted on ideology. It didn't act on science. No. It listened to the it listened to whatever was the loudest screaming crazy voice and adopted that, just as it did on the whole gay movement. There's no theology behind a renaming service. Um, there's no uh, sense of wrestling with uh, anthropology and the uh, ident- of, of identity mm-hmm. in doing this. Instead, it's okay. Let's do whatever whatever floats somebody's boat because it's what the cool kids are doing down the street. Um, and I it's, guess it's, maybe I don't know, but I keep getting embarrassed by what happens in the Episcopal Church, and maybe I should be like the Nigerians and just say, you know, I'm done, but uh, there you go. Yeah, it's crazy. It, it's one of those crazy stories, and I, I'm weirded out that it happened in North Dakota, you know, so, a, a largely conservative state. In, uh, in England, there was a, a transgender man who became a woman named Rachel Mann who was made an archdeacon in, uh, I forget which diocese, I think it was at Manchester, well, whatever. And some friends in England report that uh, clergy disciplinary measures have been threatened against any person 
who doesn't call this person a woman now. If you misgender, that's now an action that you can be kicked out of the ministry or penalized for. Mm -hmm. um, it's just going to happen in the Episcopal Church one day, I'm sure. But, uh, but in, you, I mentioned flyover country here in America. Over in the location of the Church of England, the UK, they have the NHS. The NHS has completely stopped doing transgender therapy or affirming therapy. They won't do surgeries and they won't do um, chemical care. Uh, they stopped that because they did the research. They did the science and found out if we don't treat a person who's 12 years old, who says that they feel like they're a boy now, and we let them go till 18, they will grow into their uh, biological sex. They'll grow into their proper gender. You just have to wait it out. Why would we want to leave this uh, child with a lifetime of hormone therapy and scars? Because we couldn't wait and uh, wait out this little, mi you know, minor psychosis in their life. Well, the, the cult, in many respects, the Episcopal Church is, is a good indicator of when the cultural moment has passed. Uh, <laughs> It used to be a used to be a thing. If you saw something being touted on the cover of Time magazine as the latest greatest thing, mm -hmm. sell that stock because <laughs> by the time Time magazine had uh, had figured it out, people had already made their prop money and were now trying to dump it on on the rubes. Uh, there's a coffee chain called Costa in the UK, uh, Costa Coffee, and sort of like a Starbucksy type thing. And they had a, uh, a recent ad, billboard ads, where they had uh, a shirtless person, shirtless man, with stitches here uh, across their chest, uh, mastectomy stitches. Mm -hmm. And basically, they were celebrating uh, a woman who had a mastectomy to become a man in their coffee ads, little stick figure type drawings. And maybe a year or two ago, this would have gotten nods of winking approval from the, you know, the uh, chattering classes but this is blown up in co uh, costa coffee's face i think mm -hmm. there's a pushback about from mastectomy uh women who've had breast cancer i mean how you know inappropriate and gross can you possibly be uh to normal people saying god you people are crazy it's sort of the uh, maybe it's the start of a, a bud light uh, phenomena in in england with costa coffee where some woke addict exec you know, just thought that they'd catch the moment when the moment had passed. Well, not just catch the moment, but they want to affirm this. They want to make the abnormal normal. And mm -hmm. um, they clearly filled the universities, filled the, high, filled the high schools, and filled our education with the normal climate hysteria and now trans hysteria. And to watch adults just completely walk away from Bud Light, you know, to the point of it was... 32 billion now has been lost uh, by Anheuser-Busch with the, just that one short-term Bud Light commercial that wasn't even, even played anywhere. It was a, just an ad on, on, on the internet. Uh, that, that was 32 billion because Bud Light is flyover country beer. That's not mm -hmm. the beer of the elites. That's not the beer you find at your It's not your a home. craft brew. It's not a craft <laughs> brew, brew you find in southern Manhattan. Uh, I have a nephew who would never drink Bud Light. Uh, but that's that's a flyover beer. That's a beer where uh, the red states drink it. And the red states said, no, don't it's play. It's quantity <laughs> over quality when yes, you drink Bud Light. It is. Volume over quality. Yes, quality. And, and the red said, no, don't screw with our beer. And look what happened. Now, there's places who could get away with this. I think Starbucks could probably get away with it because it's elitist. And mm. this takes me all the way back. I remember uh, a ad I saw with uh, Catherine Jeffords Shorey where she was, uh, they had a picture of her. I don't know if she said this, but a picture said, we're the Episcopal Church where you don't have to leave your brain at the door. Well, if you're adopting trans aff affirmation, you are leaving your brain at the door. Because the science, the empirical science, the psychology science is clearly on the other side of surgery and chemical castration. So, yeah. So that's, just ask yourself, Kevin, who's making money out of the whole trans phenomena? Yeah. Uh, it's the and, surgeons, uh, it's the pharmaceutical companies, it's the people who robbed us blind during the COVID crisis. 
They're now they've now got another way to line their pockets and buy boats and second houses. September of two thousand seven. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the age of my rig. Uh, you go back to that date. There was one gender sex gender clinic in all of America. 2023, there's 426 gender surgery clinics in all of America. And of course, it's about the money. We didn't one day evolve as a human species into having uh, been born in the wrong body. This is a social contagion. Uh, and we as the church should be le leading the charge against it. Uh, and it's embarrassing to watch the Church of England and the Episcopal Church. Episcopal into Church, it. <laughs> yep, leading the charge, uh, yeah. following the pack yep. instead of standing tall for Christ. Absolutely. Embarrassing. All right, let's move on to our next story that we can beat completely to death. Um,. And this was kind of an off-the-cuff thing you mentioned last week. We didn't cover it, and there's some stories I saw on Facebook. But an MP uh, in the UK questioned the Church of England as to why are we not getting rid of priests and bishops who do not support women clergy? I think it's time that as an established church, a church established by a state that you get rid of these people because we don't want them and they're just tiresome, George. Yeah, uh, Parliament has prorogued, meaning it's gone on vacation for July. And at the end of, uh, for August, the end of July, uh, the Church of England has a representative in Parliament. The Church is established by law. That person is a sitting member of Parliament whom the government gives the position of third, third Church Estates Commissioner. And that person is now uh, Andrew Sellis, who is an MP for uh, Southwest Bedfordshire. He was, and there are times when questions can be asked of different government ministries, and the Church of England is one of these ministries, if you will. And a Labour MP, Diana Johnson, asked, hasn't the time finally come to require all candidates to ordination to assent to the ordination of women? Meaning it's been 29 years, since the first woman priest, nine years since the first woman bishop, haven't these old farts gotten around to seeing the light? And shouldn't we force them either to get in or out? And then a conservative MP, Sir Peter Bottomley, uh, from Worthing West, who happens also to be in favor of gay marriage, uh, jumped in and said that, uh, you know, it's a civil rights matter of those who want full equality of women should make sure that the church takes an action to do this. Now, Andrew Sellis said, you know, he hummed and hawed and said, oh my goodness, this and that. But it, if you are a traditionalist in the Church of England, that's reached the point that the women's lobby are now winding up compliant MPs of both main parties to attack you and destroy you. So, it's not just going to be on homosexuality and gay blessings. I mean, this is going to go across the board. Any agreement that is made uh, to protect you is only as good as the honor and integrity of the people backing it. And what we saw with uh, mutual flourishing, oh, of course, you know, we're going to allow everybody to flourish. Big lie. It was. Um, so now you're seeing the back half of the women's thing. You know, we'll will give women an opportunity and we won't penalize those opposed to it now 29 years into it if you don't agree out the door you go what's going to happen with the gay blessings and uh things like that if they make the same sort of commitments or promises yeah will that be worth as much as this promise on the, the mutual flourishing and i have to wonder would parliament or the mps in parliament be even questioning the church of england if the Church of England had stayed the course, if the Church of England had not uh, adopted for uh, a pro-women uh, clergy, pro-women bishop uh, strategy 29 years ago, and I think the bishops were 10 years ago, um, mm -hmm. if the if the, the MPs would have had enough respect to know that, hey, we're not going to bother with the church. If 
if the Church of England had a little more dynamic leadership, mm -hmm. uh, where in essence, if you were basically a little fearful of Justin Welby because he was a bright, powerful, articulate fellow and you didn't want to mess with him, you wouldn't see MPs taking time up, beating up the Church of England. Mm -hmm. Now, from a practical point of view, there's not enough time in the parliamentary calendar for them to devote to the Church of England. They just, you know, there are other more important things to be done than mess around with the Church of England's rules. That having been said, because the Church of England is viewed with disdain and is viewed as weak and it's viewed as rudderless, all of this uh, saber rattling can take place because the whole purpose of this is gay and women activists sort of get their MPs to say stuff, the MPs say stuff, and then the activists say, look, it's so important even members of parliament are taking it. It's a circular sure. you know, thing. There's no spontaneous action by parliament on this. Um, it, it's just, it's all put up job. It is, it's put up. So we will and, it, and and if you had and if you had two archbishops who together at least had one full brain between the two of them and ca character and dignity dignity then this crap wouldn't happen excuse my language that's all right no problem now last week we mentioned that central florida has a new bishop uh, you talked a little bit about your meeting with the bishop and uh, how you're encouraged uh, for your diocese and for your bishop's ministry and how this will affect your church this week we have uh, news that clergy, uh, two clergy, clergy persons are leaving the Diocese of Central Florida and moving to uh, some Florida ACNA churches. Yeah, we, I got a letter uh, from the bishop, we all did yesterday, saying that uh, Brian Garrison, the rector of uh, the Holy Presence in the Land, mm -hmm. which is up near Daytona, sort of inland, is leaving uh, the diocese to become the rector of an ACNA parish outside of Jacksonville in Middleburg, Florida. And Gladys Rodriguez is leaving her church and going to all, uh, uh, Winter Garden, which is right. Covenant in, uh, which Winter Garden, yeah. which is in the geographic area of the diocese of central Florida. Now, I actually think this is a wonderful development. Central Florida, I think maybe the only diocese of which I'm aware, where there's a two-way traffic yes. between the ACNA and the Episcopal Church. We have three or four rectors currently in the diocese who came from the ACNA. Uh, the, the most prominent is Ellis Brust, uh, who's rector, and his wife Cindy, and they're rectors of a church in uh, Fort Pierce and Melbourne. And Ellis is not all of a sudden become liberal or whatever. He's just... <laughs> received, he felt God's call to sure. minister at this church. It's not all of a sudden that Brian Garrison has figured out the Episcopal Church is poison, but rather he's been at this church. It was time he was looking for a new place and he received a call and this is where God is leading him. And I think it's a good thing to have this cross-pollination of people going back and forth between the ACNA and the Episcopal Church now, in this the, area. Yeah, in, in the Diocese of Central Florida. In Central Florida, because yeah. it keeps us both honest and strong, and we get the best of both, mm -hmm. and we influence each other in a positive lights, rather than constantly being at legal battles and loggerheads and things like that. And they're not fleeing. Nobody is fleeing the Diocese of Central Florida. Nobody is fleeing the ACNA in Florida. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's just cross traffic, and mm -hmm. they, they can do that without having a big investigation. Yeah, <laughs> and it's and, not just people who are under investigation who are leaving for another parish. Yeah, and it's very different from the situation we discussed in uh, Austin, uh, was it last Sorry. week? Two weeks ago. Where the Ch Church of the Resurrection was leaving the a a C4SO uh, for the Diocese of Texas, because all of a sudden it discovered that, hey, the ACNA isn't pro-gay and has some dioceses that don't allow women clergy, and, you know, it, it's not people on the sort of post on the Canterbury trail coming out of, of non-denominationalism and they keep going past the ACNA into the Episcopal church. And eventually they'll wind up in the Unitarian church. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like that, but rather worldviews that essentially are aligned here in this part of Florida, uh, between the ACNA diocese and the Episcopal diocese. Yeah, when a priest, it's not a priest. Theological world. Right, it's, it's not a priest waking up one day and having Rod, Rod, Rob Bell syndrome. 
you know, mm-hmm. where, you know, oh, uh, everything I believed in is wrong. God is love, you know. And so, you know, it, that's not the situation that's happening here. Uh, it, it's people, uh, same theology, just going. It, now, and I don't know this for a fact, but I, I would assume the pension in the Episcopal Church is a little better than the pension in the ACNA uh, for now. It's a lot better, Kevin. It's a lot better. <laughs> so hopefully that will change soon. But, uh, uh, you know, it, th- there, there are reasons to go one place and not the other. Um, uh, but it, it's nice to have the, the cross pollination and the ability to do that. Uh, nobody's taking from... Uh, the Bishop of Central Florida doesn't think that he lost to. You know, and that's that's cool. All right, let's go to our next story. Uh, oh boy, next story. It, it's more complicated because we haven't really talked about the the dynamics happening in, in all of Africa. Uh, in Niger right now, there's a coup going on, and mm-hmm. that kind of uh, is an aspect of our next story. Uh, why don't you give give the background on the coup, and we'll talk about the story. Niger is a francophone country mm-hmm. on the northern border of Nigeria. Its army has overthrown its democratically elected president, mm-hmm. who was an ally of France. The new military junta has uh, asked for assistance from Russian mercenaries, the Wagner Group, uh, from Putin. Oddly enough, the leader of the junta is a Russian Orthodox uh, army officer. Um, And this basically is part of a chain of Burkina Faso and Mali have also had coups in recent years. And France, this is really more of a French problem because they're losing their old colonies and stranglehold they had over their economies and things of that nature. And the French army has been ordered out, so on and so forth. Where this is an Anglican ink story is if you he- listen to the complaints made by the f- the army officers, it's against the French mm-hmm. and their toadies in government, and basically saying enough is enough. We must g- g- our affairs must be for the benefit of our country. Uh, gold is one of the principal exports of Niger. All of that gold goes to France under pre-existing um, under treaties. Nice. None of it stays in Niger. There's, Niger has no gold reserves, even though it's a gold mining country. And the 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 benefit of all the the mines and everything is for French companies, for the French nation. It's a legacy of colonialism, and the government is being instructed to do things not by its people, but by Paris. Now, if you listen to the complaints of the Church of Uganda, the Church of Nigeria, the African Anglican churches, they're nearly identical in tone and in substance, not in content, but in substance to the complaints about these coup leaders in French West Africa. The Church of England is trying to tell us what to do. They're saying, you know, there's a recent little, the Diocese of Bristol is rethinking its uh, support for Ugandan orphanages because Uganda has passed the uh, home anti-homosexuality law. That unless you do as we say from Bristol, we're not gonna support this orphanage anymore. In other words, we in the West believe we have a right to tell the Africans how to think, what to think, that they are somehow less educated, less intelligent, less Christian than we are. There are little brown brothers whom we must direct in all things. And the Church of Nigeria and the Church of Uganda have had enough of that. And we're seeing that also in the political realm of the colonialism of the Western nations, both the governments, the churches, the NGOs, is creating a backlash that is growing and growing and growing. And so we're going to see... and you know, opportunists like Vladimir Putin say, hey, isn't this fun? I can stick a I can stick a finger in the eye of the French, make their life miserable. Why not? You know, and I can send these mercenaries who are giving me a little grease to Niger to hang out instead of Belarusia or Ukraine. Um, we we in the West are so, are so very blind to the arrogance of our governments to the demands of our governments that they should all be like us. And in its place are people like Vladimir Putin and the Russian Orthodox who are basically saying, 
our values are akin to your values. Our beliefs are akin to your beliefs. You should, you know, be naturally our friends, not the Westerners' friends, who have only disdain for you. Um, well, well, basically condemning the foreign policy establishment of Britain and the, of the West. Uh, but of the West, but that is the new colonization. Mm -hmm. We've entered a, a time where we're not trying to uh, obtain land. We're not trying to be on a quest and uh, and take things by force. We're now taking things by policy. And our new colonization is by woke policy, by Marxist policy, by uh, gender policies and sex policies. If you don't fly our rainbow flag that we love so much over our embassy in your country, um, you're not going to get these special loans and these special uh, setbacks that we put aside for nations like yours. Uh, if you don't support the things we support, love the people we love, um, you're not going to receive um, ultra benefits from the West. And we've seen this in the Obama administration. That's when I first noticed it. I mean, it I, it's happened to one degree or another since the establishment of the United States of America and the UK. This isn't new. It's new to Kevin's eyes to see how we're forcing this new colonization on African nations, on European nations, on uh, you know Asian nations. You know, be like us or suffer. It and it's it really is funny because it used to be almost all purely economic. You know, it was yes. for our economic benefit that we we would try to, mm -hmm. you know. It was for the France's economic benefit that they basically are uh, despoiling uh, the Sahel region, shipping all the resources north. But something just recently was in the news that didn't make the networks, of course. The U.S. appointed an ambassador to Jamaica, a wealthy gay man, uh, giver to the Obama, giver to democratic causes. Sure. Well, that's how we work in America. You, you buy these plum appointments, and he's the ambassador to Jamaica. He brought his same-sex spouse, his male husband or male wife, whoever they want to call it. Jamaica, same-sex marriage is illegal. And in Jamaica, they're quite strong about that. That is a big cultural no-no. Well, the U.S. government insisted that the spouse of the ambassador be given full diplomatic honors as a spouse and this and that and invited everything. And the Jamaicans said, no, I mean, this is abhorrent to us. No, no, no. And the United States responded by expelling somebody from the Jamaican embassy in Washington and basically saying, look, we could close your country tomorrow. Uh, your economy is tourist driven or resource driven. And it's owned by American companies uh, from your from your bauxite mines to your hotels. To, and we've got how many millions of Jamaicans in the United States? We could make life difficult for each of them, every one of them by hindering money transfers. We don't need to send the Marines in to tell you what to do. We can just make life difficult for you until you adopt our gay ideology policies. Mm -hmm. So Jamaica has basically very grudgingly allowed one gay marriage in the country. Now, that's the U.S. ambassador. You and I have been to Jamaica on, on assignment uh, many, many years ago. If you have uh, went to Jamaica on a cruise ship, you probably don't know anything we're talking about here. Jamaica is a very impoverished country. Uh, it's probably two steps below third world in, in certain regions. Mm -hmm. um, it, Parts it, of Kingston are just... Are, they're almost as bad as Baltimore or Chicago. <laughs> yes, there, there are this. There are cities that are just ghettos. Um, mm -hmm. There, the crime rate there is, you know, off the charts. Uh, the impoverishment is off the charts. It, you know, it's a little better than Haiti, and that's not saying a lot. So, it, it is such. It is very easy for uh, the the United States or. Uh, the UK to apply just a little bit of pressure to get what they want uh, financially or threaten. And it worked. And that's, I think we're, we're, we're trying to articulate something that we've not heard really peop other people who are smarter than us talk about, which is the worldview of the West is being imposed on the rest of the, of the globe in a very heavy-handed 
ill-informed, unpastoral, undiplomatic way mm -hmm. that our ideologies now assume assume such paramount importance that we can tell other people how to live, what to think, what to do. And we have no compunction whatsoever of punishing those who don't agree with us. So it's, uh, and we're seeing this in the church world. We're seeing this, you know, if, unless you, and, you know, we, this has been going for a while. I can remember at the 98 Lambeth conference, ha sharing a taxi with Ron Haynes, the Bishop of Washington, back to the airport and him telling him how mad he was the diocese of Washington was given all this money to Uganda. And now they had voted against gay uh, on, you know, against the gay stuff. And he was furious because he wasn't getting his money's worth in sending stuff to Uganda. Uh, now, at the time when I, this was like, oh, very embarrassing. You can't really say this out loud. But now there's no compunction whatsoever. Do what we say, or we're going to cut off the money. Mm -hmm. And that's in the church. That's in the government. That's in the NGOs. You know, if you want books for your children to read, you have to have books that include that Heather had two mommies. Um, it's just. The, the Heather, Heather used to be a daddy. I know, yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, the 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 odd thing here, George, is we, we report on society for the last twelve years. It ain't getting a lot better. <laughs> and I, to, I would have never thought that the stories we talked about this week and last week would have even been on the anybody's radar. Uh, in 2009, 10, 11. I, there's nothing here I would have thought in the future. I never had a moment when I'm sitting down contemplating life thinking, one day men will be able to mimic women and take their sports and take their jobs and take their scholarships and it would be against the law for women to complain. I never thought that. Well, Kevin, could you have possibly imagined an American industry making trucks would be gone in 15 years so that you've got to get it from somebody in China or have it made customly at a machine shop because truck parts are now outsourced yes. to who knows where in the world. Yeah, well, yeah, but in my world, having a broken down RV is not a big deal. It adds a little stress to my life, but... Uh, I'm here to interact with people and uh, share the gospel wherever I am. And I've landed here for a month in South Dakota. South Dakota will hopefully be better for it, and hopefully I will too. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 818 of Anglican Unscripted.